Well, welcome to today's update. There's a lot going on as, as usual. We'll have some things going on in the United States, the United Kingdom, in Europe. And we'll notice that the Americas is now becoming the new epicentre of the current uh, pandemic. But let's start off with a few things that the World Health Organization have been saying. So they're saying the pandemic is accelerating. Now, this is looking at it from a global picture. So this is certainly not going away. So it's been great that we've seen reductions in some areas such as Europe. But overall, globally, the pandemic is accelerating. The number of new cases is increasing as time goes on. And now we're well over a half a million. So this was the daily increase, 150,000 or more globally. Over eight and a half million officially confirmed cases now. And we know that the real number is higher than this. Almost half of the new cases the World Health Organization noted are from the Americas, the North and South Americas. And we know that Brazil, Peru, Mexico have got greatly increasing numbers. And the World Health Organization is saying the world is in a new and dangerous phase. So they see accelerated growth in many parts of the world. Now, obviously, I'm concerned about increasing cases in places like the United States. But way back in January, February, when we started talking about this, we realised that there was an excess, uh, a greater risk rather, an excessive risk in poorer parts of the world, in poorer countries. And we did talk about South America, the African countries and the, the Asian countries at that point. And, and to a large degree, this does seem to be happening now. So that's partly why it's in a new and dangerous phase. The World Health Organization tell us the virus is still spreading fast. They say it's still deadly and most people are still susceptible. So it looks like there's only about 10% of the world's population have been exposed to this virus so far. Perhaps not even that. The, the World Health Organization estimates go from 1% or 2% through to 10% or, or slightly more. So what that means is that 90% of people in the world could still get this virus. It's still... We're still at an early stage in this pandemic. Now, I've just come across some new things on sense of self, smell. So before we go into other countries, I think I'll just talk about this now. Now, this was interesting. The prevalence of the loss of smell, according to the uh, COVID symptom tracker app, is 60% at some point of the illness. So 60% of people who get COVID-19 at some point in their illness get this loss of smell, this anosmia. And of course, when we can't smell, taste tends to go as well. So really quite common, up to 60%. That was that was interesting. They're not all going to present with that. The, the presenting number is probably nearer 30%. But uh, at some point, most people get it. Uh, for several weeks in some people. So it can be for days or it can be for a day or a few days. But it can be several weeks in some people. The average duration is five days. So people that lose their smell, the average time they lose their smell for is five days. And the rates are threefold higher in individuals testing positive than those testing negative. So people that claim loss of smell, um, for everyone that claims loss of smell who isn't positive, three are positive. So what this means is it's a good indicator of who is positive, therefore a good indicator of being infectious. And people with loss and smell should therefore self-isolate until they've been tested. So if you do acutely you, you lose your smell, it's three times more likely that you have the virus than you don't, according to these figures. And they uh, advocate uh, testing your sense of smell at home. Use things that have a distinctive smell that are easily identifiable and that are familiar to the individual being tested. So, for example, children, orange, vanilla, mint... Adults, garlic, coffee, coconut. Of course, avoid irritants, avoid air fresheners and aerosolized things. We don't want aerosols going into the lungs. Avoid bleach and other strong smells that can cause tingling sensations or harm the nasal passages. That's fairly obvious, but very often, unfortunately, these obvious things need uh, said. So a jar of coffee, grated zest of a, a citrus fruit, orange, lemon, lime in a bowl. Sprig of mint or basil or, or a, fr a fragrant shampoo. Apparently coconut is good if you lose your sense of smell for coconut. That's indicative. Perfume or essential oils. 
I don't know if you've got Vic in the United States, but in the UK we have this Vic, which is like a strong smelling uh, thing you're supposed to clear the airways. Not sure it does really. And uh, so, someone was sniffing their Vic and they thought it had gone off because they couldn't smell it. And of course, it's a very strong smell. So loss of sense of smell. Interesting. 60% of people, maybe 30% of people presenting. And if you do lose your smell, then self-isolate until you're proved negative would be the advice. And uh, just feel free to test yourself. You know, I love the smell of coffee. And if I couldn't smell coffee at all, then that would be an indicator that possibly I've developed COVID-19. Now, um, Florida, we've got a dashboard for Florida. Uh, do, do, do look that up. The, the cases in Florida are increasing. I just checked on that before I came to do this talk, actually. And there's lots of information on there. So obviously, I post all these references. And um, it look, looks like Florida could be the next epicenter of transmission. It's, I'm, a, I'm a bit fearful it could be the new New York. Cases in New York are down quite substantially now, but Florida is now on the way up. And this is this is what we see, the peaks and troughs in different places at different times. So 90,000 cases in Florida now, 3,200 new cases in the past 24 hours. Limited mask wearing, bars and restaurants busy. Make your own conclusions. Texas and Ohio cases are increasing. Oklahoma cases are increasing. And there's a political conference due tomorrow in tomorrow or the next day in Tulsa, where lots of people will be attending a political conference, which is probably not the best thing for the current pandemic climate. California, on the more positive side, has uh, mandated state wearing of masks in public places, so that is encouraging. Countries that mandated mask wearing have done well. That's basically a fairly simple fact. Now, the, uh, the new cases in the UK, according to the COVID symptom tracker app, are 3,612 new cases in a 24-hour period. And that is down 26% since last week. So a very impressive reduction there. And do look that up for yourself and browse other fascinating information in this uh, site related to this app, the King's College London site. Now, the app itself, this is the app as opposed to this particular app, um, the, the one that was being tested in, in the Isle of Wight, well, that's off, that's scrubbed. Government have packed it in. Apparently, it was only having about a 75% success rate detecting Android phones and about a 4% test rate detecting Apple phones. So it was an appalling, dismal failure, basically. So um, anyone on the Isle of Wight who downloaded that in good faith, I appreciate what you've done. You made a good go of it. It wasn't your fault. There's intrinsic faults in the app. So now the government have decided to work with uh, Google and Apple together. And uh, they're going to make an app that works. But when is anyone's guess? We're talking two or three months away, probably. It's been a bit of a unfortunate episode, to put it mildly. Now, the alert level in the UK has gone from four down to three. Uh, and this means gradual relaxing of restrictions and social distancing measures are possible. So we're now on uh, we're now on three. We're now on alert level three in the UK. Um, now, what these mean is a bit subjective because we've already eased some restrictions. So it's a bit strange really but just to remind ourselves uh level level five is a uh, um material risk of healthcare services being overwhelmed therefore we need extreme social distancing level four uh, uh high risk uh high or rising level of transmission and that would mean that mandate uh mean, mean we needed enforced social distancing we've now gone to three uh, the virus is in general circulation, so social distancing has been relaxed. If you're struggling to follow the logic here, don't worry. <laughs> I am as well. Um, level two, the numbers of cases and transmission are low, so minimal social distancing required. And level one, green, COVID-19 is no longer present in the UK. No show social distancing, which we're a long way off. So they're the levels. So we are now currently on level three. That's the current official thing. And this is related to the government's tests. 
which uh, we have looked at before. These do make sense. Test one, making sure the NHS can cope. Test two, uh, a sustained and consistent fall in the uh, daily death rate. So we now have that. We do now have that. Rate of infection decreasing to manageable levels. Well, the rate of new cases is decreasing, whether that's manageable levels or not is more difficult to tell. So we'll give it half a mark for that one. Um, test four, ensuring supplies of test PPE can meet future demand. Well, that is doing reasonably well now. So we will give that one a tick. And test five, being confident any adjustments would not risk a second peak. That would overwhelm the NHS. So yeah, I can see that these are basically in place. So we can afford to go down a level. Because of what I think we're going to see now with the relaxing in restrictions we have, I don't think we're going to see a second peak, but I do think we're going to see an increased level. And I think this will just sort of go along at a increased level between now and winter is what I think may well happen. Now, um, Thailand, 25 days with uh, 25 days with no uh, domestic transmission. So they've had, they've imported some cases from Saudi Arabia, I think it was, but there's been no person to person contact within the country, which of course is excellent news. And I've just been sent a couple of uh, pictures I'm just going to share you in Thailand. This is in the, the metro in Bangkok. So we see seats closed off for social distancing, uh, which is good. And we see the population, the people are, are actually really complying with this. We see no physical contact. We see absolutely everyone wearing masks. Uh, we know that all these fitments are cleaned on a, on a very regular basis. So actually, those control measures do seem to be working. And of course, you wouldn't want as many people close to that inside in public transport if you can avoid it. But it does look like the community transmission in Thailand is under control with just the few odd imported cases. So remarkably good news. And we've looked at reasons for that over the past few days as well. Now, the outbreak in Beijing that we had talked about, um, query from that market, um, the Chinese authorities are now saying it's under control. They've done 360,000 tests in about the last three days. Impressive, impressive. Genome data indicates an old virus. So they're saying that the genome of this virus that's caused this recent Beijing outbreak is not the same as the genetics of the virus which is currently causing problems in other parts of China. So what, what they're saying is because the genetics are slightly different, there's been some mutations that have moved on from this because we know these, this virus is constantly mutating. And uh, th th what they're saying is that this virus either came in from Europe, so it was a Chinese virus that went from China to Europe and now come back again, quite possible in frozen salmon for example quite possible or it's a virus that's like been hanging around somewhere in Beijing for a long period of time now if, if that is the case if this is a virus that's been like hanging around in Beijing for a period of time it's a bit hard to see where it's been because there hasn't been any active cases in Beijing for quite a period of time before this and the virus isn't going to survive for days and weeks on surfaces. So I'm a bit surprised at the Chinese authorities' reasoning here. It seems more likely to me that it's a re-imported virus, but that, that's what they're saying. So uh, l let's uh, wait and see for more information on that one. Now, this is interesting. The debate about the origin of this virus just won't go away. And part of the reason it won't go away is we don't know. We don't know where it came from. The, uh, the full investigation is not being opened to um, international experts. So um, internationally, we don't know. Now, whether they know in China or not, we don't know whether they know or not. But we don't know. Internationally, we don't know. So um, now I've been reading that the wet markets have been ruled out by the Chinese authorities. Now this really throws a bit of a spanner in the works of what we'd assume for ages. So it looks like it's not from wet markets now, but, but I don't know. I don't know the reasoning on that. We, we need more information, but it's interesting. It looks like it's almost certainly from bats. That seems to be pretty well agreed on. 
And what is also known is the Wuhan Viral Institute has been studying bat viruses for years. Hmm. There you go. Not saying what it means, but that is a fact. But the world's intelligence agencies are saying that this virus has not been purposefully manipulated. So even although this virus, in my view, could well have escaped from a viral lab, say, for example, in Wuhan, um, it's not a genetically engineered virus. It's not that humans have fiddled around with it. It could just be a virus that was being studied that happened to escape. Let's hope the Chinese authorities really open up to that so we can actually find out. Apart from anything else, I'm just very, very curious. Now, Saudi Arabia, the number of coronavirus cases in Saudi has exceeded 150,000, following a rise in new infections over the past 10 days. Now, the reason I put this in, and this is particularly interesting, is Saudi is one of the hottest countries in the world. So, you know, it's never cold there. And now it's coming on to a, a warmer time of year. It's summertime there. So the temperatures will be high and yet the infections are thriving. So I think that really is the last piece of evidence we need um, to say that this virus is not seasonal. It's thriving in a, a very, very hot country in Saudi Arabia. So it looks like the heat is not a protective factor. But of course, Saudi Arabia is a very dry heat, whereas Thailand, which has been much more successful than Saudi Arabia, is a very humid heat. So is it that the virus is able to thrive in dry conditions, but does less well in humid conditions? That's an interesting possibility. But I think from the Saudi experience, we can say it's not a temperature dependent effect. Over 4,000 new cases in um, 24 hours in Saudi. And they're expecting to lift a nationwide curfew on the 21st of June, which, of course, is pretty close now. So that will mean inevitably an increase in cases because herd immunity has not been reached anywhere in the world yet. We'll continue to watch with interest. Germany, uh, 10 million people have down downloaded their app, which does appear to be uh, working, unlike other apps that could be mentioned. Now, Italy, now this is, in, this is interesting as well. Um, and I might show you a video in a minute as, as well about this. Um, Italy, first case reported mid-February. We, we reported it on this channel. We know, we know this. I remember well when the first case was reported in February. Because we've been following cases in China, then wham, all of a sudden, case in Italy. But it now turns out that coronavirus had been in Italy for two months before that. Two months. According to the National Health Institute study for wastewater. So apparently they had collected wastewater samples that they'd collected uh, way back in uh, last December, December 2019. And of course, it was only at the very end of December 19 that the Chinese informed the World Health Organization. So... What this is saying is the virus was in Italy before the Chinese authorities informed the World Health Organization that this virus existed. It was already in Italy at that stage. So spread of this virus around the world is getting pushed back and back as more investigations are done. So, th so they collected these samples of wastewater way back in December. So they had these samples of wastewater. They've now gone back to look at them. Presumably they were in sealed containers and genetic traces of SARS coronavirus to COVID-19 virus in samples of wastewater collected in Milan and Turin last December. So there you go. That is proof this virus was circulating in Italy last uh, December. Will further evidence push it back further still? Interesting. Now, this is India fitting up an emergency liquid oxygen tank, which is good because we know oxygen can be life saving. And there's the workers uh, fixing that down COVID 19 medical oxygen. And that tank will hold quite a lot of uh, medical oxygen, that's for sure. And these are the trains that they're kitting out in India as emergency hospitals. So I would imagine these are probably being used now. Now, Let's just look at a couple of videos. Of this. Yeah. 
Now, I must say, that that's Victoria Terminal in um, in Mumbai. It's not called Victoria Terminal now. All the Indi- all the locals call it VT. I can't remember what it's popping. It's, it's got a new Indianized name now. Uh, but that, anyway, that's VT. And um, I must say, I'm very impressed by the discipline that the people there are showing. Very impressed because I've been there a few times passing through uh, VT in Mumbai. And uh, it's normally, let's just say, it's not normally as well organised as that. On the trains, though. So we, we do see a, you know, a fair degree of social distancing, but um, good to see the mask wearing, of course, but they're still awfully close together. Let's, before we look at India, I found this graphic on masks. I don't know how accurate it is, but I like it. So let's zoom in a bit. He doesn't know he's sick. With an incubation period of up to 14 days, he spreads COVID without knowing he is sick. So here we are. Um, COVID-19 carrier without a mask. Transmission probability, even if this healthy person is wearing a mask, is 70%. And those figures do make sense to me. COVID-19 carrier with a mask. It's gone down from 70% to 5%, even if the healthy person is not wearing a mask. The key thing is everyone wears a mask to protect others. And if both people are wearing a mask, it goes down to 1.5%. So the main reason to wear a mask is to protect others, but it also protects the individual wearing a mask to some extent. So nothing we didn't know there already, but it's nice to see these infographics. They they explain it very well. Now, moving on to India as well. Um, increasing cases, increasing deaths, st- still, still very low amounts of testing. Now, um, President Modi says that Yoga forms a protective shield of immunity against the virus. Um, Let's just say there's no evidence for that. Not saying good mental state doesn't help, but let's say there's no evidence for that. And a protective shield? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Now, a Chennai-based scientist here in the Hindustan Times... uh, ...claims there's a connection between COVID-19 and a solar eclipse... ...which apparently is happening soon... Now, if you're watching in India, um, th- there's a history of um, astrological type thinking in India. And uh, let's just say there's no scientific basis for it, shall we? So um, we'll, leave it, we'll leave it at that. There's no scientific basis for it. And if this is a Chennai-based individual, I'm not going to call him a scientist. So Chennai-based uh, random person claims connection between COVID-19 and the solar eclipse. I really do not think so. Okay, now, this thing about the the disease arriving earlier. Now, I'm going to play you a video now of Kenny. And in October, in October 2019, Kenny had an illness. And Kenny's had uh, influenza and colds and things many times. But he says this felt completely different. And quite a few people I've talked to who have COVID say it's a completely different form of feeling when you have the illness. So is it possible that Kenny had this in October? He works in the United States. He does work at a travel hub. Uh, He's near an international travel hub. Um, Do I think it's likely? Probably not. But there again, I've had so many people like Kenny send me information in about last October, November. I mean, up until recently, if someone had come from Italy and said, do you think I could have had it in November, December? I would have said no, but now it looks like they could well have had in November or December. Certainly in December in Italy, we know for sure now we've got scientific data from that. So um, let's listen to Kenny and, and just see what you think. I, I really don't know, but it's, 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 it explains it well and it's very interesting. So let's see what Kenneth says. Well, my name is Ken. I'm in my 60s. I am a smoker. I 
live not too far from Washington, D.C. I'm in the northern Virginia panhandle. I'm also close to Mount Weather, Site R, Fort Detrick, and a lot of other places some people are interested in. Um, my story is interesting. I work as a uh, coffee boy in a convenience store. I am considered an essential employee. I've had flu many times in my life. I know what the flu feels like. In October 2019, I became sick with something different. I ran a fever. I would cough and cough. I could not it felt like I was drowning. I finally picked up a, acquired a uh, blood oxygen pulse meter gauge and my blood oxygen had dropped down to the low 90s. Uh, I continued to get sick. Some of my coworkers also started experiencing problems as well as some of our customers disappeared for weeks on at a time and came back later and told me they was uh, they had been very sick uh, when my blood oxygen dropped down to the mid 80s I went to urgent care which is a subsidiary of the local hospital and I was examined there they confirmed that I was sick with something they didn't know what, in the words of the physician I attended, I have no doubt something is going on, but I'm not sure what. Uh, they x-rayed me. They took a blood specimen. Uh, they determined that there was an infection in my lungs, and they sent me home with an asthma spray. Uh, and instructions to go to the emergency room if my blood oxygen continued to drop or if I got worse. Uh, a few days later, my blood oxygen level improved and I began to feel better. In all, I'd say the infection had run about a week and a half, two weeks. Uh, I don't know what it is. I should add, I've been back to that urgent care facility on a different matter. Uh, I'm also a diabetic as well as being a smoker. And I've been told my suspicion I had it back in October is not unique, that there's about 20 or 30 other patients uh, at that who have been through the urgent care who also believe they had COVID-19 back in that early time frame, earlier than officially recognized. Of course, I'm being told that there's no way I could have because the disease did not officially exist until November at the earliest. Uh, I have doubts about that. At my facility, uh, I do see a lot of travelers. We're not too far from Dulles Airport either. And I did know one or two of the people who were heading to China for, for the military's uh, trials, the games. Uh, I have a suspicion myself and some others acquired COVID-19 well before the official date. Uh, I realized that having COVID-19 uh, before the Wuhan games uh, is not politically viable because officially we got the disease from China, not the other way around. I'd love to have been able to get an antibodies test back in December of 2019, but it wasn't available then. In fact, since I'm not in the ER, not in an ICU ward, I still can't get my antibodies test. Where I work, people cough on me every day because I'm considered essential. Making coffee is an essential task for travel, for commuters. 
Um, but anyway, that's my story. Thank you, Kenneth. We uh, appreciate that very much. Um, you know, if, if you told me that story and said it was in December or January, you know, there'd be no real doubt in my mind that that was COVID-19 and the fact that there was a cluster of people with it as well. Now, of course, even if Kenny, uh, Kenneth uh, tested positive for antibodies now, um, that wouldn't tell us necessarily when he'd contracted the disease. So basically that information is now lost to history unless some clever person can work out a way to um, sort of work, work it out somehow. I don't know. But um, curious, curious. So that was October. We know for sure it was in Italy in December. So maybe one day we'll know. 